This is CBN News Watch. And thank you so much for joining us. I'm Ephraim Graham. Today ahead, Hurricane Florence is gathering strength in the Atlantic and headed for the U.S. East Coast. President Obama on the campaign trail and the reaction from the Trump administration. Also, why we are not hearing much about one of the most important stories of the year, the strong economy, and the beginning of the Jewish New Year and the significance of the biblical holidays. Up first, that massive Hurricane Florence posing a serious threat as it barrels toward the East Coast. The National Hurricane Center forecasts Florence to be a Category 4 or 5 storm when it makes landfall Thursday. The storm is now a Category 1, about 600 miles south of Bermuda, and it is quickly gaining strength as it moves northwest towards the U.S. The eye of the storm is expected to fall on Wilmington, North Carolina. Winds could reach upwards of 150 miles an hour with catastrophic flooding. People in coastal communities are taking all precautions. States of emergency have been declared in North Carolina, South Carolina, as well as Virginia. And joining us now with more on Florence, where it's headed, is Joe Bristardi. He is the chief forecaster for Weatherbell Analytics. So, Joe, where do you think Florence is most likely to make landfall as of right now? Well, I, there's nothing we can uh, say different from the Hurricane Center. In fact, uh, Wednesday... On Weatherbell, we put out a forecast 10 days away or so that this was going to hit in those areas because of the uh, type of pattern that we were in. And in fact, on August 23rd, uh, the Japanese generated computer model uh, showed that we were going to get into a real big burst. And I was on here in the Christian Broadcast Network uh, setting up Gordon with that a couple of weeks ago. So this is all part of a two to three week burst. Uh, once we get to September 20th and beyond, it's uh, it's all done, uh, essentially. Uh, so uh, Florence, to me, is a done deal. Uh, and by that, I mean this. Uh, folks, uh, if you follow us on uh, Weatherbell, I'm not trying to be pompous or egotistical. Ego means edge got out, by the way. So I'm not mm -hmm. trying to do that. I'm just, just trying to recap that this has been a long time coming. And so I have no changes, uh, no difference from what the National Hurricane Center has. It's going to be a uh, storm uh, comparable in intensity at landfall to Hugo and Hazel. Those are the benchmark storms in the on the uh, Carolina coastline, uh, ca strong Category 4 hurricanes. But the difference with this is it's not going to move fast. It's going to go inland, sit over the southern Appalachians, and lead to three to four feet of rain in parts of South Carolina, North Carolina, perhaps even into southwest Virginia. So when this is all said and done, this is probably going to be the costliest storm in the history of the Carolinas, because not only are you dealing with a major hurricane hit, but you're dealing with a flooding of biblical proportions. Mm. Uh, not only that, you folks on the Texas Gulf Coast, we think you're going to get hit by a tropical storm later this week. This is going to develop out of the Western Caribbean and come at Texas. We have a couple more out there. Isaac is uh, going to get into the Caribbean, it looks like, this weekend. It will probably be a hurricane when it gets there, then it will weaken. Helene will stay out at sea. And uh, this whole end game with Florence, by the way, is that the storm stalls, dies, but tries to come back southeastward early next week into a large area of low pressure off the southeast coast of the United States, which in and of itself may be something to watch, too. So we've got 10 days of wild weather in the tropics and then... As, as fast as it came up, you're going to see it calm down. Yeah. All right. Well, Joe Bersardi, thank you so much. We will certainly be checking in with you as this gets closer. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you for having me. President Obama, who has been relatively silent during the last 18 months, made the unprecedented decision to condemn President Donald Trump by name. He's also encouraging voters to restore, quote, sanity to American politics. Vice President Mike Pence expressed his disdain with the former president's decision to speak out. It was very disappointing to see President Obama break with the tradition of former presidents and become so political. The American people in 2016 uh, rejected the policy and direction of Barack Obama. Democrats are supporting President Obama, saying President Donald Trump is an unconventional president and his behavior over the last 18 months is what compelled President Obama to speak out. Our correspondent Amber Strong has been following this story for us. She joins us now from Washington. So, Amber, what does President Trump have to say about former President Obama hitting the campaign trail? Thanks, Avram. Yeah, President Trump in in true to form as President Trump is, uh, had a quite a bit of different reaction than Vice President Pence. President Trump, in a campaign rally this weekend, said he tried to watch Obama's speech, but he fell asleep. He said that Obama is good for sleeping. Uh, but then he took kind of a serious tone and urged the voters that voting is incredibly important this season. 
uh, and that the very stake of his presidency was at hand. Of course, he's referring to the idea that Democrats could take the House in November. And if Democrats take the House in November, then impeachment is sure to follow. Amber Vice President Pence also spoke about this New York Times op-ed in which an anonymous member of the administration says he and others are undermining the president's agenda. What's he saying? Vice President Pence took the extraordinary steps to not only push back against this narrative, um, but also push back against the idea that he wrote it. There was a bit of speculation going around that uh, the use of this word lodestar, it's kind of a unique word, uh, that Vice President Pence has, uh, has taken a liking to. He uses it quite a bit, uh, which led some to speculate that it was Vice President Pence who actually authored this op-ed. Uh, in, in an interview with Fox News Sunday, Vice President Pence said, not only did I not write the op-ed, I am willing to take a lie detector test to prove that I didn't. Uh, he's urging whoever wrote the op-ed to resign, and several members of the administration have also followed his, his suit of U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley wrote an op-ed of her own in the Washington Post saying uh, that whoever it is, if you have this issue with the president, you need to resign. Uh, she went on to say that when she has an issue with the president, she says it to his face. All right. Amber Strong reporting for us from our Washington bureau. Thank you, Amber. President Trump has taken some hits in recent days from a book depicting a chaotic White House to that op-ed in the New York Times from an anonymous senior staffer. But one story you aren't hearing much about is the positive economy. The latest unemployment numbers show 200,000 new jobs were added just last month. That's a message the president's team wants to get out because they believe it could affect the upcoming midterm elections. Our Heather Sells brings us that story. If Republicans hold the House in November, the economy could be the reason why. It's why President Trump is trying to keep the subject front and center. We've created over four million new jobs since the election. It's not a terribly hard sell. Consumer confidence is soaring, recently hitting an 18-year high. Unemployment is at near record lows. And business investment helped push the second quarter GDP beyond expectations. Still, the mainstream media doesn't talk about it, much less give any credit to the president or his tax cut. Media watcher Dan Gaynor says it's no surprise. When we find out the economy is growing, not even at 4.1 percent, but 4.2 percent uh, for GDP, oh, there, there's barely any coverage at all. We, you get all-time record low unemployment for African Americans, barely any coverage. Harkening back to Bill Clinton's famous quote, it's the economy, stupid. Conservatives like Ralph Reed believe most people are focused on what's happening in the country, not inside the beltway. I don't believe that the voters care about what the media cares about. That was amply demonstrated in 2016. I think for the average American, that is not ideologically motivated. They're not. They're not really uh, hard right or, or or hard left. They're interested in kitchen table issues. That's why many inside the GOP want to emphasize accomplishments such as new approaches to North Korea and Iran, plus more conservative federal court judges and a likely Supreme Court justice. I would ignore the article, I would ignore the book, and I would tell the American people what I've done and what I'm going to do. You've got an incredible story for less than two years of being president. Many believe with a strong positive message like that, the GOP will lose seats but keep the House. Heather Sells, CBN News. Here now is a quick look at some of the other major headlines we're following for you today inside the CBN newsroom. North Korea staged a huge military parade to mark its 70th anniversary as a nation, but held back its most advanced missiles. Instead of, a, instead of a focus on the country's advanced military hardware, nearly half of the celebration was devoted to civilian efforts to build the domestic economy. President Trump tweeted his satisfaction following the parade, saying, this is a big and very positive statement from North Korea. Thank you, Chairman Kim. We will both prove everyone wrong. A Dallas church is mourning their 26-year-old youth pastor who was shot and killed by a police officer in his own home. Investigators say Officer Amber Geiger was returning home from her shift Thursday when she entered the wrong apartment and opened fire at what she thought was an intruder. Officer Geiger had actually entered Jean's apartment shooting and killing him. Geiger was arrested on manslaughter charges. The shooting is still being investigated. 
The NFL is no longer expected to implement its new policy on the national anthem this season. The NFL passed the policy in May requiring all players to stand for the anthem or be punished. The policy was put on hold amid disagreements between the league and the players union. ESPN reports an NFL official said they cannot come to a compromise. Now for more on these stories and others throughout the day, you can always visit CBNNews.com. The Trump administration closed the Washington, D.C. offices of the Palestinian Liberation Organization on Sunday. The move is the latest in a series of decisions putting more pressure on the Palestinians to come to the negotiating table. CBN's Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell joins us now from Jerusalem to discuss this issue. So, Chris, why do you think the Trump administration has closed the PLO's office in Washington? Is there a strategy behind this? Uh, well, first of all, uh, Ephraim, there's uh, two reasons, one being that uh, they believe that it may be violating U.S. law. Uh, U.S. law requires that if the PLO office is going to uh, stay open, that it can't threaten the U.S. or Israel to take them to the International Criminal Court, something that Mahmoud Abbas uh, has done in the past. The other thing is, I believe, as you said, they're just putting pressure on the Palestinians right now to come back to the negotiating table. Chris, what other moves there in Jerusalem has the Trump administration taken to put pressure on the Palestinians? Well, quite a few. You can start with uh, recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, moving the U.S. Embassy uh, to Jerusalem, uh, cutting UNRWA funding, and uh, just recently, just in the last couple of days, actually cutting funding to some of the hospitals in, quote, East Jerusalem. I think a lot of these are just, uh, you know, they're dealing with the Trump administration, uh, Democratic and Republican uh, administrations haven't really tried to punish the Palestinians for their uh, not coming to the negotiating table and they're dealing with the new administration right now. In light of all that you said, what kind of reaction are you hearing from the Palestinians? Well, Saeed Barakat, the chief Palestinian negotiator, is saying it's madness. He's saying it's not doable and all these moves are just making it more difficult for the negotiations. But I think in many ways, they may be reaping what they've sown because they haven't come to the negotiating table uh, for a long time and they're dealing, as I said, with a whole new uh, way of dealing uh, with, uh, with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict uh, with the Trump administration. All right, Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell joining us from Jerusalem today. Thank you, Chris. Coming up, President Trump may have made progress in reducing the nuclear threat from North Korea, but there are still other potential nuclear enemies around the world. And the Pentagon is working on a new defense against them, an idea from former President Reagan defending America with weapons in space. We've got that story. It's coming up next right here on CBN Newswatch. Welcome back. Taking a page from former President Ronald Reagan and Strategic Defense Initiative in the 1980s, the Pentagon is looking into the possibility of deploying weapons in space to defend the United States and its allies. As CBN national security correspondent Eric Gonzalez shows us, Reagan's Star Wars policy idea has become the missile defense shield. Pentagon top brass are now considering the use of space-based laser weapons as the ultimate solution to missile threats. The timing is due to the growing concern over Russia and China's increased technology in hypersonic missiles, the kind of attack that experts say would currently leave the United States vulnerable. The challenge with hypersonic vehicles is to know that they are headed your way from several thousand kilometers out in time to get your defending asset into the battle space. Michael Griffin, Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, says $20 billion would allow us to build a network of 1,000 missile interceptors that would be launched from satellites. In last year's defense authorization, Congress directed the Pentagon to draw proposals for space-based missile defenses. Griffin says China has conducted dozens of tests of a new hypersonic missile designed to strike the United States. He adds Russia is also developing this kind of technology. Current ground and sea-based defense sensors are not designed to detect these missiles that can travel at speeds over 7,000 miles per hour. Unlike current ballistic missiles, hypersonic weapons fly into space and return to Earth's atmosphere in unpredictable trajectories. Only space-based sensors can spot these threats early enough to shoot them down. You can't see it, you can't shoot it. If you don't know where it is, I don't really care how many interceptors you've got, they're totally ineffective. And the, the best place to do that from where we, what we can see as the threat matures, especially for the hypersonic threat, is from space. The United States is facing the greatest danger, I believe, in my professional lifetime, uh, 
of now some 40 years. Frank Gaffney of the Center for Security Policy says we have allowed U.S. defense capabilities to weaken while our enemies have built up their abilities to attack us. And the Chinese and Russians are doing this with research and technology pioneered by the U.S. The emergence of the danger from Russia and China with respect to these advanced nuclear missiles uh, combined with our diminished capability to deter their use against us is creating an immense danger and I don't think enough Americans are aware of it. Gaffney says the American people need to know this information and urge their representatives in Washington to act. Only then the U.S. military can put this technology in place and stop a hypersonic missile. Eric Rosales, CBN News, Washington. Up next, we're entering a special season, the season of biblical holidays, beginning with the Jewish New Year. We're going to take a look at these important days and the meaning behind them. The story is coming up right after this. We are entering a special season of biblical holidays. These traditional Jewish holidays begin with Rosh Hashanah, the traditional New Year, and they include Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. But there's more to this season and the Bible points the way. CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell joins us again now to show us why. Rosh Hashanah literally means head of the year, the new year. But biblically, it's much more than that. In the book of Leviticus, it's called Yom Teruah, the day of the blowing of trumpets or ram's horn, the judgment day. The only commandment during Rosh Hashanah is actually to hear the sound of the shofar. Okay. And so everybody gathering in the synagogue to hear the sound of the shofar. It's something that people connect to their soul to hear the sound of the shofar. The piercing sound of the shofar is meant to remind the hearers to repent of their sins and to make things right with their brothers and sisters. The rabbis say that reconciliation with God and man confounds the enemy. A shofar is a musical instrument made from a horn. This is the oldest uh, musical instrument. And the Jewish Orthodox who have a committee to hear the sound of the shofar during the uh, new year, the, our uh, ju judgment day. As part of a two family business, Eli Ribach is a third generation shofar maker. The process is uh, poly grinding, polishing, then we drill an uh, open uh, mouthpiece. This is uh, quick, but it's a lot of experience and a lot of hand uh, work because each horn is a different size, different thickness, so you have to be experienced to make a good shofar. The ram's horn is used as the traditional shofar because when Abraham showed his willingness to sacrifice his son Isaac, God provided a ram to be used in his place. It's actually, all type of horns are kosher, except of a cow. That's because the Jewish people don't want to remind God of the time Israel worshipped the golden calf in the wilderness. Besides the distinctive tones of the different horns, there are three different blasts sounded. The shofar is blown in synagogues and at the Western Wall each morning for a month before the holiday to give plenty of time for repentance. You and I both know that uh, we need a lot of reminders in our daily life to repent, to think of the things of God. It's like an alarm clock for the soul. Reebok says it's not just Jewish people who blow the shofar. We sell the shofar all over the world. We sell it to Jewish, to Christian, uh, Messianic people, evangelist people. Rosh Hashanah is the feast of the seventh month, but in Jewish tradition, represents the new year. At the coronation of the kings of Israel, the shofars would blow. They would announce the new king or they would announce the coming of the king. Oftentimes in the Christian world, shofars are blown throughout the entire year. But in Judaism and in Jewish practice, those shofars are only blown for a very limited time throughout the year. During this time, the month of Elul and Rosh Hashanah. Boaz Michael, founder of First Fruits of Zion, says that's a foreshadow for those who believe in Yeshua, Jesus. And they tell us something, they're speaking to us, they're reminding us of something. And one of the things they're reminding us of is the creation of the world, the coming of the King, King Messiah one day at this time. 
uh, the coronation of his kingdom here on earth. This is what the shofar is to remind us of, and it's, it speaks to us every day when we hear that sound. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Coming up, his latest album has been out for months, and even so, it is still in the Billboard's top 10. We've got an exclusive preview of Jonathan McReynolds' latest single. It's coming up right after this. Recording artist Jonathan McReynolds' Make Room album continues to ride the Billboard's top 10 months after its release. McReynolds now, McReynolds now begins his concert tour and he's giving CBN Studio 5 an exclusive preview of some new music he'll be sharing. It comes as his single, Not Lucky I'm Love, remains in the top five gospel songs almost a year after its release and it's approaching a return to number one. As we wrap today's show, here's an exclusive sample of his latest tune. It's called Try. Crazy wife. I don't want to be that crazy guy who lost what I had inside. Mm -hmm. and I don't want the sinner's destiny. And I don't want to miss what's best for me. To that I can only say amen. Jonathan Reynolds is on tour right now. It's time for your Monday motivation and today I challenge you to take a good long look in the mirror and when you do, see what God sees. You are fearfully and wonderfully made and you are made in His image. He doesn't see all those flaws that often you allow to overshadow what He sees. With that word, I encourage you to make today, this Monday, a marvelous Monday and expect good things to happen. That is going to do it for this half hour of CBN News Watch. Remember, you can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about at CBNNews.com. We'd love to hear what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can do that by emailing newswatch at CBN.com. And of course, you can always reach out and touch us on Twitter, Instagram, as well as Facebook. Remember, the news continues 24-7 at CBNNews.com. We're updating that throughout the day for you. Hope you'll join us again right here next time. Make this a marvelous Monday. Goodbye and God bless.